trying to determine the appearance of repetitive numbers throughout your day is omen reading. Assigning a life-changing meaning to the appearance of such things as a dragonfly before you is also omen reading and divination. It is seeking the will of the gods rather than the god who knows no other god before or after him. It is to be avoided. This leads away from the one true and holy God, and it leads our hearts unto ourselves. If you want to know what your purpose is as a Christian, read the Bible and not omens. It will tell you how to conduct yourself as a Christian and who Christ is in you. Hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against him. You just heard an excerpt from my latest blog post featured on Love Subscribe. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Subscribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Subscribe. Today's topic is an interesting one. You may be wondering why I'm talking about chasing dragonflies and not reading numbers. And well, this is something I once took stock in as a charismatic Christian. You see, I used to see 11s and I still do throughout the day. I see, I'll look at the clock and I'll see it says 1111 or 111 or I'll see different numbers. But mainly it was 11s and also dragonflies was a big thing too. And this is something that the prophetic movement does talk a lot about. I remember hearing a well-known prophetic minister talk about this a few years ago about how dragonflies, if you saw them, that they represented transition was coming into your life. And that sounds really good, but it's also a very vague and generalized message. It's not it's not really for direction at all but and at the same time it's also doing something that the bible explicitly says not to do which is reading omens trying to determine our future trying to find signs that are pointing us in a certain direction when we really as christians we do not and should not be doing that we should be reading the bible in order to know how we're to conduct ourselves and what god loves and what he hates and when we don't know the word then we can fall into error and deception And so this is why I wanted to talk about this today. I want to help other people come out of the same deception that I was in and to not fall into things that we should not be doing. This whole thing, this omen reading, which people don't call it that in the prophetic movement, but that's what it is. This has become part of the prophetic movement and to essentially believe that God is speaking to us and giving us direction for our lives and signs like this or even in specific numbers during our day. You know, I know that there is a tendency, and I've done this in the past and had to repent of it, but there's even a tendency for us to take a biblical passage that has specific numbers attached to it. And I'll talk about that in just a minute, but we'll actually turn that into like an omen. If we see a certain number, then we'll try to attach it to a a biblical passage. I, I know that for myself, I sadly paid more attention to these things than to the Bible. And this is why I did not know that what I was doing was reading omens. You may be asking what is wrong with finding relevance or meaning in these things and believing that God is speaking to you and to me. If we were to sit and chat about this, you may even share with me your experience with this. We can talk about experiences here in a bit, but it would be best for us to look at Scripture and to see what the Bible has to say about such things. So let me say that this is not to condemn or to bash anybody. I'm not trying to be a right fighter here. I'm merely just trying to point you to the Scriptures and to help you and I both to know the truth because John 8:32 says when you know the truth the truth will set you free if the and it prior to that even says Jesus said if my word abides in you then you are my disciples we want the word of god to abide in us and then when it does then we can be set free the truth will set us free and that truth is found in the word of god so Deuteronomy 18 is a great place to start we'll be starting with verse 9 and working our way to verse 14. I'm going to be reading out of the ESV for you. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14 says, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination, tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. 
So we see here in Deuteronomy 18 that Moses is giving the Israelites instruction from the Lord. And the instruction was not to adopt the practices of the nations of the promised land to which God would give Israel. In fact, these nations would be driven out because of these abominable practices. And we see this here. The practices are listed. You know, we could easily say as Christians, we would say, well, I would never do these things. You know, I would never go to a fortune teller. I would never entertain someone who's a psychic or a medium. I would never go to someone who communicates with the dead. Some of these things are obvious to us. But then we don't even look at the fact that some of the things that we're doing, we don't have that same terminology on them, like omen reading, looking into numbers, trying to determine different signs that happen throughout our day. Those are things that God has explicitly said in his word. He told the Israelites who were to be a people separated unto him. And that's, a, again, a type and shadow. We see this all throughout the Bible. As Christians, we are set apart for Christ. We are not to look like the world. We are not to entertain those things. We are not to do them because it draws us away from God. Ultimately, this is idolatry. It draws us away to worshiping other things. And it ultimately draws us away to being God of our own lives, that we think that we have all the answers and that we're depending on these things rather than trusting and putting our faith in Christ. These practices were things which would draw Israel away from God and unto other gods and even other human beings for direction. They would not rely on the Lord. God told them that he had not allowed them to do these things. And interestingly, verse 15 in Deuteronomy 18, as we go on even past that, that verse goes on to prophesy of another prophet like Moses who would come after him, which tells of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would be a mediator between the Father and his people. So when I looked up the word divination in a Bible dictionary, it described it as the practice of making decisions or foretelling the future by means of reading omens and signs. To engage in such practices is to be unfaithful to the Lord. So again, our trust is to be in Christ. And when we start putting our trust in the fact, for example, for myself, that I was looking at the number 11 all the time, and every time I would see it, I would think, oh, change is coming, transition's coming, big things are coming for me. I wasn't trusting in God. I was trusting in numbers on a clock. Now, you may not think that there's anything wrong with that. But looking back now, I can tell that my focus was in the wrong place. I wasn't focused on God. I was focused on what was in it for me. What those numbers meant for me. What I was going to do. What was going to happen in my life. How I was going to minister and do all these great things. I wasn't putting my trust in the Lord, really. And I wasn't focused on him, on worshiping him. I was trying to figure out the answers for myself, just from a number or a dragonfly. The divination was done by nations surrounding ancient Israel. And we see it in Exodus with Pharaoh's magicians who copied signs God did through Moses. The Philistines practiced divination. We see that in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 2. The book of Daniel tells of diviners and such which advised the Babylonian king. King Manasseh was considered evil for divination. We see this laid out in 2 Kings chapter 21. Isaiah continuously condemned the practice of divination. Zechariah told the people to trust in the Lord for rain and not diviners. And Jeremiah the prophet told the people not to listen to diviners. And we see this in Jeremiah 27 verse 9 and 29 verse 8. Now, the New Testament talks less about divination than the Old Testament does. You may be surprised to know about that. And we see it mentioned a few times in the book of Acts. And Galatians 5.20 says that sorcery and witchcraft is a work of the flesh. So to do divination is to seek the will of the gods by examining and determining omens and telling the future based on signs. So you may be asking, well, what is an omen? An omen is a sign used to predict the future. That's the definition of an omen. Pagan prophecy utilized the reading of omens. An omen is believed to signify change. So, you know, we, we think of a simple thing like people who see a black cat cross their path. That's known as a bad omen, that there's bad change that's coming. Or, you know, walking under a ladder or, you know, breaking a mirror, or, you know, different things like that. Well, this is no different. This is no different. And just because we attach biblical Christianese 
terms to what we're seeing with a dragonfly or butterfly or the number 11 or 747 or 222 or whatever the number, you know, whatever it can be. Just because we put God's name on it or we say, well, the Lord is showing me this. We're not testing things, first of all, and we need to do that. So that way, again, we don't fall into deception. Now, at this point, you may be in disagreement with me, and that's okay. Listen, I like healthy disagreement. And I welcome people when they read my blog posts, I welcome them to make comments as long as we can have a a conversation together and be respectful. As Christians, we are told in the Bible that we are not to be people that are quarrelsome, but that we are to be gentle and be humble. That's something that God has really had to work on me about because I can have a strong personality. And so this is the characteristics. These are the, this is the fruit of the spirit. If we really belong to Christ then we have to put our pride aside and we have to be willing to be corrected by the word of God, by God himself through his word, to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and to be led by the Holy Spirit and not say the Holy Spirit's doing something that would contradict his word. So you may be in a disagreement with me and that's okay. And you may even be thinking that those instructions are stated in the Old Testament to the Israelites and that they don't apply to us today. And I would say though it's in the Old Testament, that's irrelevant. Because we believe what 2 Timothy 3.16 says is that the word is God breathed and it is profitable for correction, for instruction, for training up in righteousness. And if we believe that about the scriptures, then we're talking about the Old Testament as well. And God is the same God that he was in the Old Testament as the New Testament. And God has not changed his mind on what he loves and what he hates. And though this was to the Israelites, this also alludes to the fact that God's ways include having a holy and separated people holy unto him even today. He knows what will draw us away from him, and he sets boundaries for a reason. When we read omens, whether unknowingly or knowingly, we are following after other things for direction and even trusting in ourselves or others who claim to have divine revelation. Now, I know that some will want to mention the presence of signs in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament. And though we are talking about the practice of reading omens and divination, essentially, signs in the Bible were to testify of God as the one true God and to point to Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God and the Messiah. When you look in your Bible and read this, you will see a pattern, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Signs are not proof of God working as we know that Scripture warns. In Matthew 24, and that there will be false signs and wonders done by false prophets that will be done to deceive even the elect. And we can also read in John 12, where Jesus performed many signs and yet the people did not believe in him. So that's a different, to me, that's a different um, topic, a different subject is talk where we're talking about doing signs. I've had people ask questions about that. And it's a very good question. It's a valid question, but we're talking about omen reading today. We're talking about taking an object or taking a number or whatever, what have you. And we're talking about assigning a prophetic meaning to that, that that God's trying to speak to us outside of the word and to give us direction for our lives and, and to do this and do that. And what's interesting to me, and, and again, I say this as someone who used to do these practices, is we get so wrapped up in these signs and these, these things that we're seeing and we're trying to interpret what they mean all the time. And yet we are so consumed in that, but we're not consumed in what the Bible tells us to do about how to conduct ourselves to our spouses. We're not consumed with wanting to be better fathers and mothers to our children. We're not consumed with wanting to be better employees before our bosses, to be honorable people, to be respectable people, to be God-fearing people, to be people that are led by the Spirit and not by the works of the flesh. We're not really consumed with being people that are honorable before the Lord, that have integrity, that are that are reverent to God. Uh, I believe that we've lost a lot of reverence in the church, especially in the charismatic church. There is a lot of ir- irreverence that goes before God, even though his name is said at times, there's still a lot of irreverence that goes that we've lost the fear of the Lord, the the reverential fear of God. This is in one of those areas. When we begin to do things like this, we are mistreating what God's instructions are and because we don't know them because we may be ignorant of them. And that's where I was. I was ignorant of these things. So we're going to talk about this. And and let me say this, we need to use caution. Uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, 
one thing that I had done, again, I repented of this, and I know of people that have done this, is that we will see certain numbers, for instance, and we will assign a biblical passage to those things, and we'll say, well, this passage says this and this, and, and so it must be tied to these numbers somehow, and this is the meaning of it. And so I want to say this. We need to use caution in using a particular scripture with the same numbers to validate or authenticate our seeing specific numbers. Chapters and verses are not divinely inspired. Chapters and verses were established by people for easier reference to Scripture. The Scripture itself is God-breathed, and we need to hold more reverence for the Word of God rather than indirectly using it like a fortune cookie. And that's what's happening. We're having numbers that we see throughout the day, which I know some people may take offense to this, but sometimes we're seeing numbers just like if we buy, for instance, if we buy a car and or we're interested in a specific car, and then we begin to see that car everywhere we go, but we had never seen it before. We never paid attention to it. It's because in our brain, there's been something that's been activated that we begin to memorize and begin to see that and draw attention to it. And that could be what's happening too. So other things to consider here, the meaning of the dragonfly or of numbers. Now I've taken a little bit of time to look up the meaning of the number 11, for example, and the meaning of the dragonfly and to share the sources of many of these sites for this information. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. A lot of these people that we're listening to that are flowing in the prophetic movement, they are probably not getting their information from reputable sources. And some of these former these ministers will even tell you that they've had a former background in the occult. And this should really bring us some pause. Because if someone has a history of the occult in their background then it would stand to reason that maybe that person needs to be even more scrutinizing of what they're coming in contact to make sure that it does line up with Scripture. We need to know what the Bible says. The Bible is not an outdated book. It is the Word of God, and it is profitable for instruction. It is to help us so that we don't get off course and that we don't follow other gods and we don't look like the world and that we do not fall into deception. So I wanted to share a couple of these things with you when I Googled in a search engine and I just looked up the number 11 and its meaning. One of the first websites that popped up was angelnumbers.com. So let's read a little bit from that site. I'm going to find it here on my computer. When I look up the number 11 on angelnumbers.com, it talks a number, it talks about a number of different things. It says, one of the most talked about numbers in numerology and the most mysterious is number 11. There are a large number of people who are obsessed with the number 11 and especially the date 1111 and time 11 hours, 11 minutes, as I was just telling you a minute ago. They considered that angel number 11 is one of the most profound messages that were sent from angel realms, the angel's realm to our world. Now, let me also say this. I am not promoting this. I'm just telling you what's on this website. So please don't think that I'm promoting angel worship, that you have a guardian angel, that you need to seek after angels. We are never told in scripture to seek after angels. We are never told that we can call forth angels. Those are God's angels. They're not ours. I'm merely reading from a website just so we make that clear. This website also says on angelnumbers.com, 11 is the number of faith and is widely related to psychic and prophetic abilities. If you have this master number on your numerical chart, use it to create personal strength and spiritual advancement. Do not deny your instincts. Let the inner voice push you towards growth and stability. This goes on to say the angel digit refers to associative relationships. Talks about guardian angels on here. It says that the number represents our intuition, not to see with uh, just with our eyes, but with our soul and senses. We must be open and receptive to all hidden meanings. It says in tarot, that should be a red flag. In tarot, number 11 is linked to the justice card, which symbolizes balance, decision-making, and fairness. It goes on to talk more and more about this. I hate reading. I don't like reading some through some of this, but I'm going to just to kind of give you an idea of what you're coming across because, again, this is extra biblical information that people are getting, and it's not, again, where it's not lining up with Scripture because this is omen reading. We are using numbers to try to determine the future direction of our lives, and we are told not to do this. Angel number 11 also represents a transformation through intuition, truth, balance, and mental abilities. This digit may also indicate certain transgressions, hazards, and sins. 
you see, there's another pattern that I'm noticing here as I see things on here like this. It's very vague and very confusing because you're hearing well, 11 means intuition and 11 means transition and 11 is a is an angelic number and then it's going on to talk about well you know 11 could also represent sin it could also represent really negative things so which is it how are you sp- <laughs> how are you supposed to know what this number is and you may be saying well the holy spirit's going to tell me well again the holy spirit is also going to tell you you're not supposed to be reading omens so <laughs> just throw that out so Anyway, it's interesting because when I, when I scroll through this website, it just goes on and on and on. Talks about the number 11 and love. Talks about the interesting facts about the number 11. Just just everyday facts. Because if you often see a series of numbers, 11, 111, 1111, there's a reason for that. And you should be fortunate to experience that sight. The most common way to angels communicate with us is through the universal language of numbers and music. So again, this whole site is stating things that we are not to be doing. So uh, angelnumber.org was the second one that popped up. And this is a, these are a few things that it said, just to give you an idea. Again, I'm not promoting these sites. I'm just trying to help you understand if you go to search for these things in a search engine, this is why we don't need to be omen reading because we're getting away from scripture and we're trusting in our own understanding or someone else's understanding when God tells us not to do these things. We are to come out from among them. We are not to do this. This is why in Deuteronomy 18, God did not want to, he wanted to give them the promised land, but he warned them because he knew if they did this, that they were going to be drawn to other gods. They were going to be drawn into idolatry away from him and unto themselves and unto false gods. Angelnumber.org is another website that just gives you an idea of number 11. It says in the most religions in the world, it is believed that there are many different meanings hidden behind the numbers. The Bible is one of the books in which we can find a lot about the symbolism of numbers, which is usually known as biblical numerology. This number is also known as an angel number because it may contain a message that our guardian angels are sending to us. Number one is actually a symbol of positive thinking and optimism. So if you are seeing it so many times in your life, it is a sign that you will get rid of all negative thoughts and your life will become much better. I'm going to continue to read on from this site on angelnumbers.org. Number 11 is known as one of the master numbers. If we take into account 11 as a spiritual and angel number, we can say that it is usually used as a symbol of balance. It means it it is necessary to keep balance in your own life and to try to live peacefully. If number 11 starts appearing in your life very often, it could be a warning for you that you have lost balance in a certain aspect of your life. This site says this number is probably a sign that your guardian angels are sending to you in order to tell you something important or to give you a warning related to your future. How are you supposed to know what this means? Again, as Christians, we shouldn't have any part in this. We have seen that number 11 has positive symbolism in most of the cases, and it is usually represented as a symbol of balance and kindness. But, this website says, the truth is that this number has a completely different meaning in the Bible. In this holy book, number 11 is usually represented in a negative context, and you will have the opportunity to read about it in the following chapter on their website. So it says that the number 11 doesn't appear so many times in the Bible as some other numbers. Number 11 as a whole number is appearing 24 times in this in this holy book. So this sounds like someone, I mean, I'm just getting the the feeling here that on this website, this is not a Christian, that they're writing about this and including it. And I'd also say this, yes, there are numbers in the Bible that are significant, that we do see repetitive, that can have specific meanings to them in relation to the Lord with number seven, the number three, the number 40, that they can have significant meanings. But that does not mean that that is prescriptive for our lives. That could just merely mean that that is descriptive in talking about what is relating to Scripture. So we have to be careful with that as well to make sure that we're understanding the proper context and that we're not reading into things again and causing uh, or trying to find meaning, hidden meanings in things when we're, again, we're not told to do that in Scripture. We're not told to try to find a hidden meaning inside the biblical passage that's secret or that needs to be decoded. And so, uh, again, this website just goes on. It's talking about that the number may symbolize a lack of organization and chaos. It says it sometimes it is even considered that number 11 can be a symbol of sin and evil that exists among the people. So 
it's just really interesting to me when I go through and read this. It's talking about an interesting fact about number 11 is that the name of Jesus Christ has 11 letters. Jesus was 33 years old, so it's it's saying 11 times 3 at the moment of his death. There were 11 promises mentioned in the Gospel of John. Uh, it is written in the book of Revelation that the Apostle John had a vision of 11 things that were connected with the final judgment. So I know that there are some people that would try to take that, and they're going to try to turn that into a prophetic meaning and such. And again, nowhere in Scripture are we told to do that, so that's why we have to use caution with that. It, it says they go on to tell you what to do if you are seeing the number 11 around you. We have already said that number 11 is known as the number of balance, equality, duality, and kindness. If your angels are sending you this number, then it could be a good sign for you. This number will help to keep you ba in balance in all areas of your life and stay connected with your guardian angels. On the other side, you need to take into account the biblical meaning of number 11, that it is far away from something positive. The biblical facts about this number are always related to something evil. And very often this number is used as a symbol of wars, aggression, etc. So if it happens that you see this number many times in your life, it is a sign that you should be prepared for big transitions that are about to come. Well, that's helpful. What does that mean? Do you see how contradictory and muddy this is? This is not based in truth. Again, it's speculation. It's opinion and it's man's understanding. And Though this site mentions the Bible and even Jesus Christ, it also focuses heavily on trusting in angels and looking for their messages. And again, that is not something that we are instructed to do. So we've looked at numbers a little bit. I just wanted to show you that and use what I had gone through as an example of seeing 11s and trying to find just a couple of sources online to give you an idea of what it would be like to look that up. And immediately it's going to get you off track. It's going to get you away from scripture. It's going to get you away from the word, get you away from the Bible. And if you're like myself, I didn't know up until actually it was last year that I started realizing I do not need to do this. I don't need to be chasing dragonflies and I don't need to be participating in, in this. So We've looked at numbers, so let's look at the dragonfly for a few moments. I went to go pull up one, I'm just going to do one website for time. I mean, when you go, you can look these up. This one website I found, it was very broad. It was um, worldbirds.org, and it talked about the dragonfly symbolism and meaning, and in parentheses, plus totem, spirit, and omens. And this is from August 2nd, 2020. So this individual talks about the dragonfly symbolism is associated with change and transformation. A, dra a dragonfly carries with it the wisdom of transformation and adaptability. And goes on to break it down with the symbolism. It represents change and transformation. It is a reminder for you to shed more light and joy in your life. It tells you not to remain in the dark or the shadows. We can easily read scripture and be told that we are the light of the world, that there is no darkness in God. Uh, darkness has not been has not overcome the light. There's things that we can read in Scripture that are truth that we don't need to relate to a dragonfly. It says in this website it encourages us the dragonfly encourages us to be adaptable, creative, and inspired, even if it means changing the way we act or think so we can achieve our full potential. It talks about the dragonfly Native American symbolism. So you see, we're already seeing in some of these that even though they may mention Christianity and such, which I think this site does. They also talk about other religions, other practices that are spiritual in nature. It talks about the Native American symbolism. I won't go into that just for time's sake. The dragonfly Christianity symbolism. It says a dragonfly is a symbol of Christianity. I, where is that in scripture? I don't think that you're going to find anything biblically related to that that's going to support that. It says it is born underwater and lives in the dark before rising up to the light. When it first emerges, it is colorless and transparent, but when sunlight hits its body, it becomes beautiful, colorful, and magical. Thus, light transforms the dragonfly. This is symbolic to Christians in the way they all become, they can all become transformed and colorful when the light of Lord Jesus shines upon them. And then it begins to use a passage out of, uh, out of context, Matthew chapter 5, uh, which is not talking about dragonflies at all. Um, it's talking about something that, that, Christ gave as an understanding, I believe, on the Sermon on the Mount. It says, Dragonflies are reminders to keep our sight upon God. They represent change. It talks about Celtic symbolism so of the dragonfly. So it talks a little bit about that. It talks about dragonflies and dreams. Um, that's another topic for another day. Dragonfly encounters and omens. 
It says, what does it mean when you see a dragonfly? There are different meanings associated with encountering a dragonfly. Some good, some negative. Again, how are we to know what that means? Because we, we don't have a biblical passage that tells us that we are to be doing these things. But in fact, we have biblical passage that tells us not to be doing these things. Not to be participating. The Israelites were not to do it. And this is something that we can, as Christians, we can understand we are not to do this. We are not to participate in this. Sorcery in Galatians 5 is a work of the flesh. Sorcery, witchcraft, divination, all of that is lumped under that whole category. We are not to be participating in such things. And even though we may not call it that, if we are reading omens, that is what that is. So this is talking about they, they can have good and negative uh, understandings or omens. For example, on fishing trips, seeing a dragonfly is considered a good omen. For it is believed that dragonflies point out to the areas or spots having plenty of fish. People who believe in magic and angels or those who do light work and healing work believe that dragonflies symbolize positive changes. There's even, I've, I think I was reading through one of these actually, that it said that if you kill a dragonfly, that that is... People believe that you'll have death in your, around you, that someone close to you will die if you kill a dragonfly. That There's just a lot of things that you can get through here that are just not, as Christians, again, it's to be cautious of this. We don't need to be participating in this. Dragonfly spirit animal. It says, connected to the symbolism of change and light. Dragonfly totem animal. This website's talking about it being a totem animal. Power animal. Tattoo meaning. Just a lot of different things that, that this can be attributed to. And again, these are, these are things that this is bringing confusion to people. They're not, people are not going to understand the truth. They're going to be constantly thinking about this and meditating on it instead of meditating on the Word of God. And it's going to be drawing people away from the real Christ and drawing them away to myths to vain imaginations, drawing them away to things that have nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, not putting our real, our, tr- our true faith and hope in him, but really looking for signs throughout our day to really help us and encourage us. And even though we may say the name of Jesus Christ, it could still be, these things are still drawing us away from him. And we have to be aware of those things so that we can repent of them and that we can get back on the correct path and the path that leads to truth. So here's some questions that I want to ask you as we're getting ready to end our time together on this podcast. If you haven't already jumped off, (laughs) which I hope you haven't. I hope that you've stayed the course and that you've just been willing to listen. I know that there's times that we have to hear things that we don't want to hear. Believe me, I understand. And there's things that are going to challenge what we've held on to for years But I want you to understand that I'm saying these things with the most sincerity and love that I can as a believer in Christ, as a sister in Christ. If you are a believer in Christ, if you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you if you've repented of your sins and that you've trusted in him as your Lord and Savior, then I'm coming to you as a sister in Christ. And I'm telling you as someone who's been in this and fallen into this trap Please don't do it. It will draw you away from God. It will draw you after myths. It will draw you after chasing after things that you will not have certainty about. But the word of God is sufficient and it is certain. It is truth. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I encourage you to read Psalm 119. It is very helpful for us to to look at that and to see and to understand how important the word of God really is, the instruction of the Lord, the statutes, the commandments of the Lord, to understand the truth of the word of God so that we're not led astray by things, that we're not easily tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that comes through that would contradict or negate what the truth of the word of God is. So as we're closing on this, there's just a few questions that I want you to be willing to ask yourself. These are questions I've had to ask myself when I think about this, when I think about what am I, what am I doing or what have I done in the past, should I say, because I don't, any, I don't subscribe to this any longer. I don't, 
whenever I see even, you know, I, I saw it the other day, I saw the number 11, uh, 111 on the clock, or, you know, I saw a dragonfly the other day when I was outside uh, running errands and, and uh, driving around at stores and getting into my car and such, and I would see them and it would remind me of what I used to do. And I don't do those things any longer. And I had to ask myself these questions, and I'd be very honest to ask these questions. Am I trusting in signs and numbers and dragonflies, or am I trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, we can get off track and get get distracted by these things, and we can say that, you know, we're, we're following and we're pursuing God and pursuing the Lord in, in all these matters, but... I want you to just to hear me on this. The Holy Spirit is not going to lead us to do something that God in his word forbids. He just won't do it. He's not going to contradict. And I know that some people will say, well, we need to redeem this stuff for the for the kingdom of God. We are never told to do such things. We are told to abstain from the appearance of evil. We are told to love what is good. And to hate what is evil, we are told to not look like the world. We are told to be separated, be holy and separated unto God. We are told not to participate in those things. We don't want to do those things and to dishonor God and to not bring glory to his name. Another question is, is my experience prescriptive based on scripture? Now, I mentioned that a little bit ago, that there's a difference between descriptive and prescriptive. There's a lot of things in Scripture that are describing what's going on. And then there are things like in the epistles that we can see. There are instructions that Paul gave to, to different different churches that we can prescribe those to our lives. We can learn how to conduct ourselves as Christians. An example is Romans 13. We can look at that and to see how a Christian is supposed to conduct themselves, how they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to act towards their the people that are persecuting them, how they're supposed to conduct themselves. You know, in Ephesians, we can find how we're supposed to conduct ourselves, husbands and wives and children. And um, the list goes on and on. But there's things in Scripture that can be prescriptive. And then there are things that are descriptive, that have nothing to do whatsoever with how we're supposed to do things in our life, but we can make them extra biblical in such a way that we can add to them and begin to to twist them and to contort them into something that they're not supposed to be. And then we lose the true meaning behind what the scripture is trying to say, and it's trying to point us to Christ. So that's another question to ask. Is my experience prescriptive based on scripture? And I would just challenge you and I with this. Our experiences do not interpret scripture, but our experiences are to be judged by scripture. And if we can't find something in the word that would validate and authenticate our experience, then that needs to be tested and it needs to be decided if it needs to be rejected or to continue to pray and to seek godly seasoned counsel that understands the word of God properly. I hope that this podcast has shed some light on this topic for you and it gets you thinking about participating in things like omen readings and looking for signs that could be drawing you and I away from the Lord. So again, I don't want this to be something that condemns. If anything, the Holy Spirit convicts us as believers. He convicts us when we're led by the Spirit, when we truly, when Christ truly knows us and that he, that his Spirit indwells us. We will be convicted, we will be quickened in our hearts to understand that if we're doing something that's grieving God, that's not bringing glory and honor to his name, that may be another Christ that's being preached to us, ministered to us, that we would be willing to search the scriptures and make sure that what we're believing is so, and that it aligns with truth. I pray that this podcast has blessed you, and I want to encourage you, get into the word every day. Read it, meditate on it, study it. Be a student of the Word of God, not just to get it in your mind. You can have scriptures in your mind, but if they're not written on your heart, then it's not going to bring transformation to you. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of us as believers in Christ to lead us into all truth. And His Word sanctifies us. It sanctifies us in the truth. 
When Jesus prayed that in the garden of John 17, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. We are to depend on the word of God and to help. It helps us to guide us into all truth. And so I encourage you, don't just memorize or just know, have head knowledge. But like I was talking about in that blog post at the beginning of this podcast, have the word written on your heart to where and hidden in your heart to where you do not want to sin against God, that you know what he does not want you to do as a believer that would lead you away from him. And I pray that you understand that God is forgiving and he is merciful. And that if this are things that you've been doing and this convicts you, that all you need to do as a believer is say, God, I repent. I acknowledge that I've done this. This has been sin against you. I repent of it. And I ask God that you would forgive me and that you would help to renew my mind and to lead me in the way everlasting and to draw me into the truth of your word and help me to discern properly what is of you and what is not. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesickscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.